And welcome to our request for proposals review for rounds nine of our textbook transformation grants. Um, this is just about 11 o'clock right now. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to post them in the chat. If you can change your send to to all participants, uh, please do so. I'm not sure if WebEx will let you do that. It, it really depends. But either way, if you're sending it to me, I will be able to address the question um, as soon as it comes up. And the first part of this will be kind of a slide presentation, just going through what the grants are. And then after that, we'll be uh, sharing my screen and going into um, Info Ready Review, which is the grants application, um, uh, the grant application platform that we're using. So, hi everyone. I'm Jeff Gallant. I'm the program manager for Affordable Learning Georgia. Um, Pam Buffington is helping us out with the application process. She's over at Georgia Tech in the Center for the 21st Century University. Um, she and her team run the Info Ready Review platform and in the past even did uh, a lot of assistance with peer review before that platform even came into existence. So she's been helping us out quite a bit with this and we're, we're glad to see them back. So the reason why we're doing grants is because we really want to make sure that we can fund the time and the support for uh, a team of faculty and librarians, instructional designers to transform either one course or multiple courses, um, sometimes even throughout the entire department, uh, into courses that have um, free or lower cost options, including open educational resources, library resources, obviously we have plenty through Galileo, um, and free resources that are out there. And there are different ways to use these, and we go over that um, quite a bit at the kickoff meeting. So part of the reason why we have textbook transformation grants is to pilot different approaches for textbook transformation within the highest impact courses out there. So if we can have at least one implementation that has a report with all the lessons learned throughout the process, um, what uh, materials that you used, uh, any new materials that were created, um, that stuff gets shared out and that leads to uh, an easier understanding of how to transform these courses in the future. Hopefully we wouldn't have to have grants for every single one of these OER transformations um, soon enough, it would be very easy for someone to get started. Uh, of course, we are looking to save uh, students money by this, but also we're trying to contribute to their course retention, their progression, and their graduation. The idea is that if you are providing equal and day one access to your materials to all of your students, um, it'll be a lot easier for them to all succeed uh, as opposed to just the people who are able to get their textbooks on day one and bring them in. Um, things like financial aid can definitely delay the process and uh, plenty of students have been either not purchasing the textbook for a course or sometimes avoiding, avoiding courses because of the high textbook cost. So we are trying to uh, equalize this access and hopefully that will lead to better results. Uh, we've had eight rounds so far. Um, our grantees are all listed on the textbook transformation grants page. You can go by rounds and now we have an entire database of all of the grant projects going on um, in just one place. So you can search uh, for institution or uh, for the courses that are covered. Now on this page also is a link to the RFP, but I'll, I'll also give you an RFP link after. RFP of course means request for proposals. It's the basically the big giant document that says we have these grants, here's what they are. Um, it's addressing one application cycle in this case. Um, before we had six, seven, and eight in one RFP. Uh, because this is a, an additional one, this is going to be just one application cycle. Um, there are two different levels of funding and four different categories of projects. So we'll go through each of those. Um, 
In proposals ca uh, in categories one through three, you can address any course. Um, the fourth one is about the top 100 USG undergraduate courses that haven't yet been implemented in a grant. So the link, and I'm going to type this in too so that you can copy and paste. There we go. So that's a direct link to the RFP, and that will have um, all of the information you'll need, the timeline, the descriptions, um, links to the actual application page. That's where it is. So if you want to save just one link today, you're going to want to save that one. Now there are two different levels of funding. Um, the first one is a maximum of 10,800. That's for a standard scale transformation. So that's textbook transformation grants projects uh, that are within one or more courses or sections, um, under 500 students total enrolled on average per academic year. Um, so that is usually for smaller teams because you've got 5,000 maximum per team member with 10,800 maximum award. That 800 is always used for travel and overall project expenses. That ensures that two people are going to be able to uh, go to our kickoff meeting, um, which starts before all of these implementation processes uh, get going. And then there's the large-scale transformation, which allows you to have more team members. Um, this is basically getting uh, something like a department-wide adoption or a multi-course, multi-section adoption or a super-section adoption. Um, the maximum award there is 30,000. That allows for uh, more team members to get involved. Uh, and there's still that 800 for travel and overall uh, project expenses because only two team members absolutely need to attend the kickoff meeting per team. If you have a team of, uh, it, let's say you have an entire department, um, in that case, we wouldn't expect everybody from the department to attend the kickoff meeting, uh, especially when teaching is happening. And the project categories, there are four of them. Uh, the first one is no cost to students. Second one is OpenStax textbooks. Third one, it has to do more with uh, platforms and course authoring tools. And then the fourth one is the specific courses that I went over before. Um, the first one is kind of a catch-all. This is if you have a course and you want to transform it uh, from using a commercial textbook to uh, free your open materials and you want to either make those yourself or you can adopt them. Um, this is the basic category for all of those. So if you feel like your project doesn't fit into the other three categories, then it's this one, no cost of students learning materials uh, and that that would be the project. Uh, we have a list of some places you can find OER. That list grows per day, so um, feel free to go and check around because there's plenty of stuff out there. Uh, this is not restricted just to what's listed. And of course, you can use library materials too. Um, anything that uh, Galileo can provide. Uh, we do have a collection of ebooks that are uh, unlimited user license, so that works really well. That means that. Uh, any number of students can be viewing that ebook at the same time. Um, and you can, of course, combine these together. Uh, OpenStax textbooks, that just indicates to us that you're adopting an OpenStax textbook. Um, that is from Rice University's OpenStax College, and I will put in chat. Um, the website for OpenStax, they have a uh, a small, peer-reviewed, high-quality collection of textbooks for really high-enrolled classes uh, across the nation. And so because of that, it's very easy to adopt one of these and, you know, maybe make some ancillary materials on the side. Um, you, when you adopt an OpenStax textbook, you uh, kind of authenticate that you're a faculty member to OpenStax so they could share instructor materials with you and not with students. Um, it's a really easy way to get started. The cool thing about being in this category is that you would be 
in contact with OpenStax and they would be able to provide support for you. Number three is kind of a newer thing. Um, this is for integrating interactive course authoring tools into the classroom in an affordable way. So this could be pairing OER with um, an adaptive learning platform, or this could be uh, doing an online homework uh, utility with an open textbook uh, for calculus or something like that. Um, these are kind of a way for us to go a little bit more forward into the future with technology while also keeping that affordable part of the project. Um, if you have any questions about number three, just let me know. Um, it's been uh, it's a newer category, so it's been a little a little bit confusing to people. But we really want to get uh, different types of adaptive software implemented in these courses. And now I've got a really big list on number four, and that's just because these are the top 100 undergraduate courses that have not yet been uh, addressed with an ALG funded implementation, and that's either with eCore or with um, with our textbook transformation grants themselves. And so I'm not expecting you to, <laughs> to memorize this list here. Um, it's all within the RFP itself, and these are the ones that we would give uh, some, uh, some preference to because we haven't had an implementation in them yet, there are a lot of students that enroll in these courses, and if we have somebody to pilot that type of project, that would help out everybody else who's teaching these courses. Um, a couple of them are uh, the one semester versions of multi semester, oh, what's usually multi semester courses, so be sure to look at that too. So the timeline is pretty easy for this one because we're not going with three different rounds. We're talking about just one. Um, so in February, we released the RFP. Um, in April on the 30th, that's the deadline for applications. We wanted to make sure that we could um, reach out during the teaching and learning conference uh, for the USG and, and try to really get in contact with people by April. So that end of April deadline is, is for that reason, really get people aware. Um, May 22nd would be the date that you're notified of whether or not you, your grant had been awarded. Um, in between there, there are a couple of different review processes that happen, including a peer review process. And then shortly after that, on June 5th, uh, that would be the kickoff meeting. So there isn't too much time in between being notified and going to that kickoff meeting. So if you're applying for this, especially if you're the project lead, be sure to have this on your calendar, uh, the kickoff meeting, and uh, save it in case you are awarded because there are, you have to have at least two people from your team attending the kickoff meeting. And if the project lead is there, that's way easier because they are normally responsible for distributing the information that they get at these meetings to everyone. Um, if you're able to do that, that works out much better. Now for funding, there need to be at least teams of two. Um, that includes faculty instructors, librarians, instructional designers, um, any subject matter experts in the USG, editors, graphic designers, let's say that you're making um, a complete open textbook, you would need something like uh, maybe a graphic designer or a project manager uh, in order to do that. Um, that's why we have this much bigger list. Uh, a lot of times we just have entire teams of faculty, but sometimes uh, librarians are really helpful with helping you find all of these uh, open materials out there with evaluating them, uh, helping you out with hosting them, helping you out with open licensing. Um, we are a library-run initiative, after all, and libraries are very involved in OER. Um, and so these awards could be up to 5,000 per team member. We already talked a little bit about this, and that the 800 is for the required kickoff meeting. Now, funding works in a, a bit of a different way. Now, if you've 
had any experience with textbook transformation grants before, you'll know that they're, they don't work the same as a federal grant. They are not a direct stipend to you that has to get managed by a grants office and uh, kind of very line item controlled. The funding goes to the institution to cover your team's time to get the work done that's on the proposal. So that's done through a service level agreement, which is a basic contract that just says that the work that's on the statement of work, which is your proposal, um, will get done. Uh, here's these deadlines, and here's how much we're paying. And once that's all signed and, and ready, the USG sends funds to the institution um, to manage that. So uh, I, I keep saying how, how many times uh, up to 800 is is designated for that kickoff meeting. You just need to make sure that it's in your budget line when you um, submit the application. But of course, because we have a service level agreement, that means that you've got to coordinate with your department and with your sponsor to find out exactly how your institution does this type of grants administration and who you would need to send a service level agreement to to get signed. Um, and how they handle it. Uh, so unfortunately, I can't really answer how um, funds are used at a particular institution. Uh, as somebody who's in the system office, I know that it's very different uh, depending on the institution that you are within. So it it is part of being a project lead that you have to coordinate this type of paperwork. It's especially important at the beginning of the process, when uh, a little bit after the kickoff meeting, when the service level agreement gets out there. Now, the great thing about having a service level agreement as opposed to a direct stipend is that it's flexible. So let's say that um, one of your team members is suddenly uh, gone from the team. Well, you would obviously have to let me know about that uh, through a semester status report. But uh, in terms of funding, if somebody else were to be added on um, from your department, it's as easy as your institution just changing that member however they are distributing the funds. Um, that doesn't need a sudden approval from us. Um, same thing comes with uh, project expenses. So let's say that you only needed like half of the $800 to get out to Macon, uh, and then with the other 400 you wanted to uh, purchase a textbook authoring platform. And then you realized uh, two weeks later that that platform wasn't going to work. And even though it's in your proposal that you're going to use this one particular platform you want to change, you don't have to get express sign direct approval from me in order to do that. That is a flexible part of how the funding works because the work in the service level agreement is what's getting done. Um, and these are, uh, and the funding that we are giving is an allocation to get that work done. So if you need to change your plans a bit, that's totally fine. Um, if it if it changes in a great way, like, for example, the amount of courses that you're teaching, then obviously we need to make sure that we're all on the same page. <clears throat> Excuse me, I've got a cold of sorts today. Uh, so the way that we release funding is 50% once the SLA is completely signed, what we call that fully executed, um, and that includes the proposal serving as the statement of work. Um, then the, the final 50% is released on submission of the final report. That is at the end of the final semester of instruction of the project, so right at the end of the project. Um, that 50-50 thing really indicates a lot of accountability uh, on our part. Um, it is a little bit extra work for us, but we want to make sure that uh, we are doing this type of funding structure. It, it, it's been working very well throughout the USG. So we went, we went through this a bit already. Institutional sponsors and project leads working with them will be responsible for the disbursement of funds, including expense, travel, and disbursement. Um, and of course, the budgets are supported by state funds, and so you have to comply with state and BOR policies and procedures. Um, not the federal grant policies and procedures, but with the state funding ones. So for example, 
um, there are some restrictions on purchasing food with state funds. That's the type of thing that um, your business offices will need to be aware of. Uh, they usually know. Um, it's it's pretty easy to comply with these procedures once you've been here for a little bit. Now the required activities, um, obviously participating in the kickoff meeting is one of them, but getting the service level agreement signed is a required part of the grant, obviously, because it, the mechanics of it don't even get to work without all of that happening. Um, completing the status report for every semester of the implementation, that's a very quick one. Um, completing a final report, that's the bigger report at the end, and that includes um, your qualitative and quantitative measures on student satisfaction and success. Um, also, uh, just participation as needed in our communications. Um, if we need to have a, a, a webinar of sorts to get everybody together, we could definitely do that and call everybody in. Um, that hasn't been as big of a deal lately as it had been in the past when we were first getting started and uh, just getting our bearings. So the kickoff meeting, uh, two team members need to be there. Uh, it's a very discussion-oriented, collaborative uh, thing that has, uh, we go over our grant procedures and what an SLA is and how it gets signed and all that, but we also go over things like what does open mean? What is an open license? Um, OpenStax usually presents either virtually or in person. Uh, we talk about accessibility too. So it's a way to get everybody um, started in thinking about their projects and also on the same page when it comes to uh, some really important stuff like how to host something or how to put an open license on your own work or how to use something with an open license. So for round nine, that's going to be June 5th, 2017 at 9 a.m. Uh, it goes until 4 p.m. and that's at Middle Georgia State University. That's at the conference center in, um, in Macon, Georgia. Um, be sure to put that on your calendar um, to hold the date if you are applying for a grant because if you're awarded, you're not going to have too much time in between to suddenly change your schedule around. Now for the proposal itself, um, you're going to need the proposal application filled out in InfoReady Review and the letter of support. Uh, the proposal narrative document is there to help you. It's also there to be a backup copy of your proposal. Um, it doesn't necessarily need to be submitted to us. It's an optional thing that you can do. Um, the letter of support needs to be from the sponsoring area. That can be your department. Um, that can be your uh, bigger office like academic affairs. Um, this is the one that's responsible for the receipt and distribution of funding. Um, if you have a multi-institution team, you have to have multi-letters of support. So let's say that you've got one between Clayton State and Georgia State, which has happened before. Um, you would need a Clayton State letter and a Georgia State letter uh, in order for that to qualify. And the letters do need to uh, reference sustainability. The, the idea is that you have a supporting department above you who knows that you are implementing open educational resources or affordable resources, and they don't want to tell you um, the next year, okay, now you're all going to use this Pearson textbook and that's the end of that. Uh, we want to make sure that there is support coming from your department uh, in what you're doing. Now the review process itself is uh, through peer reviews and then administrative reviews. Uh, we select peer reviewers from throughout the USG. Uh, they cannot be submitting a proposal during that round, of course, uh, but they are usually very familiar with uh, OER, Affordable Learning Georgia, or also very experienced at uh, grants writing itself. So we get a mix of people who know OPEN very well and people who have reviewed for the national uh, uh, for things like the NSF or the NIH. Um, and they're a different group for each round. So if you ever submitted one in the past, uh, you may have completely different peer reviewers in this uh, upcoming round. In fact, you, you will. Um, the Georgia Tech Center for 21st Century Universities helps manage inquiry review. Um, reviewers get a small honorarium that goes through that. 
Uh, the proposals are evaluated on the impact of students, uh, of course. So how many students do you have? Is it an expensive textbook that you're replacing? Uh, the feasibility and the reason, reasonableness of the action plan. So is it, is it organized? If somebody is reviewing it, can they go, oh yeah, this could be done in uh, a year or so? Uh, and of course, adher adherence to the proposal guidelines, um, which you'll see that in the rubric. So to apply, first you're going to uh, complete the offline proposal. That way you've got a backup that you always have access to. Um, then you walk through the submission process in InfoReady Review. And there are some screenshots here, but I would just want to walk through that with you uh, by sharing my screen instead, because that's a lot easier. Uh, so what I will do is share Chrome with you. Um, OK. so. I'm already logged in at the moment, so let me sign out. This is the Info Ready Review homepage. And if I want to create an account, I'll go to Login. If you're part of Georgia Tech, then congratulations. All you do is click on Georgia Tech Login, and you've got um, access to it immediately. If you're not, then you've got to do login for other users, like me. So I've got my email address and password here. Um, I usually click Remember Me because I have to keep coming in and editing. Uh, usually, unless it's a public computer, you should do that too. But if it's your first time, you want to click on Register instead. And this will give you first name, last name, email address, password, prove that you're not a robot, and that's about it for creating an account. Um, after that, just check your email, as it usually works with uh, creating accounts, and you'll just verify your email, and you'll be you'll be good to go. Um, you may have to create more than one account because only one application per user can occur. So if you're submitting something from more than one team, you may need to have two different email addresses in there. Um, just something important to know. So I will log in. And all you need to do is scroll down and see ALG Textbook Transformation Grants. Now, you won't see this many options um, as, a, as an applicant. Uh, you'll just probably see Apply. Um, but you will see these three competition files on the side. One is Proposal Instructions. Another one is the Proposal Narrative Form. Uh, and then another one is the rubric. So the narrative form is the big one. That's the one that you want to use. Um, so you could just click it and download it, and it'll be fine. Um, the rubric is just the uh, set of criteria that the reviewers are going to be using to review your application. So I'm going to go into preview, which will show you what the application looks like. So at first, there's some personal details here. Um, for some of you, if you're the project lead and you're submitting the application, these are going to be the same thing, the submitter and the applicant. Um, there are some institutions that have a particular person submitting uh, applications for uh, different teams. Then the submitter would be like your grants office, for example, and the applicant would be you. And then campus role, so proposal investigator, that would be uh, the, the um, project lead. Uh, then things like grants or business office or provost, you can select those too. You can add co-applicants here. Um, it's not completely necessary to add them here because what you really want to do is have a list of team members here. So you want to make sure that in your list of team members, that you have you included, because this all gets put into one big Excel file, and then we are able to make an email list out of that. I want to make sure that I have everybody on there. So be sure to include you. Uh, the final semester in, of instruction is either fall 2017 or spring 2018. This is when all of the materials that you've reviewed and that you've evaluated and that you've created or revised are going to be used in the classroom and uh, evaluated through qualitative and quantitative measures. Uh, so if you're picking fall 2017, that's going to be a very tight schedule. If it's spring 2018, that's a little bit easier. 
your final report will come at the end of these semesters. So for example, in fall 2017 for other projects that are ending it, it's at the end of December when they have to submit the final report. Uh, so, okay, we already went through team members. This is the sponsor, pretty self-explanatory. Um, course names, course numbers, semesters offered. So this is where you would put exactly what you are teaching that's going to be transformed. Um, we have some numbers in here, the average number of students per course section, the number affected in each academic year, the number of students affected by an implementation in the academic year. Um, this is the list of materials that you're using. Uh, this depends on whether something's optional or required, um, the title of it, the cost. Um, then in here is the requested amount of funding, proposed categories, and then there's a bit about like per student cost, projected student costs, and total student savings. Um, so there's a bit about creation and hosting platforms used. So you could just put non-applicable if none. Um, we have a, an open educational resources repository through the university system uh, that can make your, um, uh, for example, your lecture slides available for everyone to see and we can make them Creative Commons license very easily. Um, that didn't always used to be the case, so everyone had to have a creation or hosting platform used. Now it's, you could put NA and we can work with you on it and it's, it's totally fine. Um, the project goals, now this is where we really get into the rubric graded part of the application. So the project goals are what are you setting out to accomplish um, with this project. I've seen some people get tripped up here. They'll put in their project goals, they'll put the entire plan, and then when they get to the plan, they're not sure what they're supposed to do. Be sure to follow the narrative document. This gives you a lot more details as to what you need to do. You'll see in here that we've added a few options. Um, you can now paste things from Word. So what you can do is go into a Word document and, you know, control C or just right click and copy. Come in here and click paste from Word and paste it in there. That way the formatting won't be completely broken when you paste it in the text box. Uh, we've had that in the past and that was uh, really tough to grapple with. So if you're pasting from Word, be sure to just use the paste from Word button. So the statement of transformation, this is more about um, here's the literature that you're referring to when you say that there's a need for this. Um, here's what my institution is, uh, uh, what it's doing, how many students there are, um, if there are a lot of students below the poverty line or something like that. This is where you would put it in the statement of transformation. The transformation action plan is exactly how this is going to get done. So if you have uh, roles designated for each of your team members, that helps immensely here. Um, you can almost kind of work it in with the timeline uh, below, but we'll get to that. Um, the more detail that you have in your plan uh, and the more clear your plan is, the better it's going to be for our peer reviewers because they want to see what, what this project's going to do, like what's going to happen during, uh, during this time uh, before the final report. Quantitative and qualitative measures are here. Um, be sure to include uh, any measures that you're going to be doing and a little bit about how. So if you're just saying um, we're going to uh, measure student success, well, that's, oh, that's a great thing, but it's also not very specific. So if you're looking at uh, grades, then how are you going to analyze those? Um, if you're going to interview students, uh, how many would you interview, for how long, are you going to do text analysis, that type of thing. Uh, that would all go in quantitative and qualitative measures. Um, basically, the more that you know about your methodology going into this, the better it's going to look. Um, timeline is all about your big milestones. So when do you um, have a particular thing done by? And then be sure to include when you get the final report done in here too. Um, the budget, this is just how you're breaking it out between your team members. Um, perhaps you have a smaller project, but you have three people. Well, then you would have to distribute the funding between those three people. 
and of course set aside that 800 for uh, travel and the kickoff meeting. The sustainability plan, um, every uh, proposal needs to have a plan to how this is going to carry over once the grant project is done with. Um, how are these going to be revised, maintained, that type of thing. Um, a bigger sustainability plan means that it's more, a bit more guaranteed to have longer lasting impact. So peer reviewers would really like to uh, see a good sustainability plan when this is happening. Then there's our references and attachments. Um, the one that's required is your um, is your your letter of support. So this is the letter of support place. You choose your file here and you put that in. Um, if you have two letters, just put them in one PDF and just submit it that way. It's a lot easier for us, and we would have both of the letters in one file. Um, you can also submit your proposal narrative document. This, this can help out if any of the formatting gets ruined or anything like that, um, but it's not required. You don't have to submit the Word version of it also. Uh, once you're done, um, you can either save your application or you can submit it. Um, here you can add email addresses for any of your team members to get notifications, or maybe you want to add your sponsor or your grants office or something like that. You can just put all this right here and they'll get the same notifications that you do. You'll have to click a box that says uh, a bit about uh, accepting the terms of the grants that um, there are required activities in the RFP they have to comply with, um, that the proposal serves as the statement of work. Um, that that type of thing. It's just kind of standard when it comes to SLA type lingo, uh, and that's going to be it. So you, if you were all done with it, you would hit submit application. If not, just hit save as draft. Now, what's really cool about this is that I'm going to go all the way back up here. Usually, when you've got your own version of an application, there will be a print button up here. And then you can go to the printed version of your application. So you can always save a copy in PDF if you would like. Um, I'll show you that back on the PowerPoint slides. So we will stop sharing. And I will jump a little bit here. So the... Um, Email may come from uh, Georgia Tech. It may say competition space or it may say info ready review. Both of those are kind of terms for the same platform. It used to be known as competition space. Info ready ran it. They decided to change it to info ready review, but a lot of their platform still says competition space on it. Uh, I'm just going to go quickly through all the stuff that I already pointed to. Yes. Okay. Um, there is the print button. Uh, so you could see there that you would just hit that button and you could print it out or you could save the PDF version. And all of the details that you had put in here will be in the PDF version of your application. Once you've submitted it, you'll get another email, probably from a Georgia Tech email address that says we've received your application. Um, this one will let you know that it's received. And that's great. Um, that means that an administrator is looking it over to make sure it's complete before bringing it into the review process. Now you'll get another one that says thanks for your submission. Um, and it will say that it's been reviewed by a competition administrator and has been accepted. That doesn't mean that the grant has been awarded. That just means that it's accepted for review um, at that point it'll be in the peer review process. So we can um, return your early submissions for revision. Uh, if you submit something like a month early and I check it over and there's something missing, we can send it back to you with some instructions on uh, what you need to add, and that'll be fine. If you submit it two days before the date of the deadline, we're not going to send it back to you because we can't include it in the 
review process if we've sent it back to you two days before the deadline. Those ones are accepted as is. So it's advantageous to um, submit as early as possible. So when you're when you're going through this, be sure to read over the rubric in InfraReady Review and review the proposal um, for the rubrics elements. I am kind of glued to my email, so feel free to send me an email at jeff.gallant at usg.edu. And now I'm going to open everything up for questions. You can either do that through chat or you can unmute your mic and talk that way. I got a question from Taya Moore. Is this available for graduate level courses as well? Yes. Um, the only thing that doesn't apply to graduate level courses is obviously the top 100 undergraduate courses. Um, other than that, grad courses definitely do apply. Uh, it's sometimes, sometimes it's tough to plan it out because you have either, uh, sometimes a smaller amount of students in grad classes, but there are ways that that could totally work. So yeah, I mean, if you have grad classes that are um, going to be in a project, that qualifies for sure. Okay, I'm not seeing any other questions at the moment. Um, I've got this recorded. It'll be on the RFP site shortly, uh, as soon as WebEx can process it and uh, make it available. Um, thank you for coming out and uh, hearing me talk about grants for about 45 minutes. And if you have any questions, feel free to send them to jeff.gallant at usg.edu, and I will help you out with that as soon as possible. Oh, okay, I've got one more question from Taya. Uh, can people from different institutions collaborate? Yes, definitely. Um, we've had some collaborative projects before between uh, Clayton State and Georgia State. Uh, the only difference that happens with a collaborative project is that you need to have two letters of support uh, when you apply. One from the supporting, uh, one from the supporting department or unit at the other institution, and one from yours. Uh, if it's a multi-institution, even more than two, that can also work. Um, just going to make that plan really detailed as to how it's going to work between you know three or four institutions, and have that many number of letters of support when you apply. I hope that answered that question. I, yeah. Oh, okay, cool. Well, if you have any other questions, uh, of course, feel free to email me, and I will uh, hopefully hear from you soon when you're applying for a grant. Thank you very much for coming.